We're so excited to have these guest speakers here today. And uh, once you hear um, them talk about this amazing piece of land, um, you will be as um, astonished and uh, impressed as I was when I got to visit there. <laughs> um, our first speaker of the day is a Jacksonville native. Cheryl Kummer received a bachelor's degree from Smith College in Massachusetts and a master's degree in social work from Catholic University in Washington, DC. Kummer worked at WJCT, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting in Washington, DC, and McLean Hospital in Massachusetts. In 2008, Cheryl returned to Jacksonville and placed her 2.5 acre Lanaquila Gardens in a residential conservation easement with the North Florida Land Trust. She hopes to create a permanent nonprofit with training for organic regenerative gardening, which would be, a res which would be resilient in the face of Florida's growing fragility due to climate change. We also have Valerie Herman. Valerie is the executive director of First Coast Urban Ag with a mission of growing resiliency, equity, and agricultural job opportunities in North Florida's food systems. In 2019, Valerie was winner in Florida Blue's block by block competition, looking for innovative solutions to remove critical barriers to food security. She is still working on this regenerative farm franchise concept along Groundwork Jacksonville's Emerald Trail. Valerie managed Clara White Missions, White Harvest Farms, as it transitioned from chemical to an organic regenerative production farm and was on the grant writing team that pulled in a three-year grant to demonstrate that farming by improving the soil biology produces equal or better yields, more nutrient-dense food, and less disease. Her award-winning company, the Food Park Project, is still creating food forest gardens but is in the process of creating a food forest nursery, all grown in-house. Madeline Ledoux is the garden manager of Lanaquila Gardens in Mandarin. Madeline began work in 2014 as an assistant gardener to Valerie Herman. In 2018, she took over the management of the existing garden spaces and led the design and installation of the river garden and the flower farm. Madeline has also done a variety of landscape design, installation, and maintenance of projects throughout Northeast Florida. A graduate of the University of North Florida, she is passionate about ornamental horticulture, garden design history, aesthetic philosophy, and proper taxonomic classification. Not my strong suit at all. <laughs> Please welcome our three speakers, and I believe we're starting off with Cheryl. Um, we, uh, if you have questions, we are going to have a microphone and we will um, circulate that around at the end. And if you're on Zoom right now, please put your questions in the chat and we will pose those to the speakers afterward as well. All right, let's welcome Cheryl. I'm really thrilled to be here and pleased that you invited us. This is my first effort to go out into public, so I'm still a little nervous. And I spent my the entire COVID year happily isolated in a way on, in my gardens and realized more than ever the importance of being able to get outside, grow things, enjoy it, and have friends in limited numbers come all masked to see you. Part of the reason I asked Valerie way back when it was 2013, to build, create this food forest garden, which we called Lanakila, because that means in Hawaiian, victory garden. And we both had experience of living in Hawaii, and that was one of the things that bonded us. And a lot of the plants that we grow there are subtropical, and ones that I remember seeing and growing in Hawaii. We all know as gardeners that gardeners, gardens are always changing and developing. You see the change through the year, you see it from year to year, and Lanaquila has also done that. And it's grown from what Valerie created in the larger part of the garden into smaller parts that are equally important. And one that I'm especially pleased about, which is the river garden, because it gives examples of the kinds of plants that can grow on the riparian coast. And it, it has been overwhelmed by the river several times, and these plants survive. 
And I'm hoping that we can do more of this all along the St. John's River and get rid of some of our bulkheads and create public parks that are really there for the people to enjoy and the plants to survive and to help us with the climate change. As she said, I'm hoping to be able to develop something with my property that will be permanent after I can no longer live there. And I'm not leaving until I have to be <laughs> carried out in a box. But it'll take some time and I'm exploring things. And I think the Garden Conservancy is now trying to create programs that help gardens become more involved and active. And that's what we'd like to do and have programs out there which we could start doing even now. And Maddie is a wonderful teacher. And we've got all the plants and the examples right there. So that's my plan. Anyway, I want to introduce Valerie who will start us off talking about the beginnings and the wonderful organic horticulture she creates and does. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, my name is Valerie, and Cheryl hired me and my company, the uh, Food Park Project, thank you, uh, to create um, a sustainable, biodiverse landscape that produces food, but it's not a farm. It's a garden, but it's more than a garden. Uh, orchard, but more than an orchard. It's actually a food ecosystem. It's habitat for a diversity of life, including us. Uh, every day, like Cheryl said, there's something new in the food park. But it not only provides us food and beauty, uh, gives us a sense of place. It also stores and sinks water into the, into the ground and helps restore our groundwater. It also takes in carbon, uh, sequesters carbon and cycles carbon to help the plants grow. Um, yes, all of these things. <laughs> um, so, this is where we started in June of 2013. Uh, Meadow uh, had some wildflowers, Coreopsis, had some betony, some bull nettle, um, but basically a sunny, uh, sandy, sun-baked field. And the question we asked is, how do we get from this sunny, uh, sun-baked field of sandy soil to a flourishing food ecosystem? And this is a question that is being asked today all over the world. So I would like to expand our focus just for a moment and take you to uh, Northern China just for a moment uh, to the Laos Plateau. Some of you may have heard of this restor regeneration restoration project. It's hundreds of thousands of acres in Northern China. And 10,000 years ago, this was the breadbasket, the fertile crescent to, of food for China. And this is, I don't know where the laser is, but uh, sorry, uh, uh, in the middle. Um, But this shows uh, regenerative techniques on a larger scale. On the left is what happened through man-made practices, deforestation, overgrazing, Defore <laughs> poor farming practices in general. People had no ownership of the land, so they would cut down trees to make some money to feed their family. And this regeneration project focused on uh, different techniques that I'll share with you and ownership to the people. And in 14 years, it went from a barren wasteland to a productive ecosystem, pulling two and a half million people out of poverty, food poverty and financial poverty. Now, one of the techniques that is, obviously you guys are gardeners, but you know water, free resource, and it, it's, better than any other water you can put on your plants from the tap. And we need to look at where this water is, what we're doing with this resource. A lot of times it just runs off of the land as fast as it can to the river, to the storm waters, um, as quickly as, you know, it taking soil nutrients uh, with it. Or are we slowing and sinking the water 
into the landscape. Aha. <laughs> and you can see the difference in the pictures. So you can accomplish this by raising pathways, doing heavy mulch, doing intense planting where there's lots of roots in the soil, lots of uh, leaves to catch photosynthesis, put things on contour. The point is that we want to hold water in the landscape as long as possible. Uh, Earth is our best rain barrel. <laughs> These regenerative techniques um, all go back to the soil. We know soil as black gold as gardeners, but how much do we know about the life in the soil? We always know worms are good, um, but creating more diversity of microorganisms and nourishing the life in the soil is really what's going to bring our organic gardening to the next level and help in our food ecosystem. Did you know that glomulin is the protein produced by fungi that acts as glue that aggregates the soil together and makes a good structure? Did you know that there's 15,000 species of nematodes <laughs> and only a handful of them are bad? <laughs> but, but the other ones are really good. So we have so many allies in the soil. So nourishing our soil is what will get us to the next level. Uh, did you know that the plant roots ex exude exudates that feed all of these microorganisms? So the more plants that we have taking energy from the sun and exuding food throughout through their root system, feeding, bribing, trading, whatever you want to say, to the microorganisms, they are they in turn give the plant these insoluble nutrients that they couldn't get by themselves. And you don't have to be a soil scientist to make amazing soil, as Maddie will get into in more detail. <clears throat> and the last technique I want to touch on in the food park itself and uh, is layers of a food system. And we're just mimicking nature. If you go in a forest, there's many levels of, of plants in the forest. And so here, we're just taking these different layers and there's there's seven, but you know, some things overlap. There could be more than seven, but this is just a basic overview. Um, so the low tree layer could be your fruit tree and the tall tree layer of nitrogen fixing tree that helps protect it while it's young. Uh, the shrub layer, we have a example here <laughs> of um, say a cranberry hibiscus. Oop, there it is. Roselle, so this is a card that I made up to help show the different layers of a food forest. Uh, so Roselle is the shrub layer, bold in there. Um, then above it could be a, a fruit tree and above that could be a, a nitrogen fixer. Below that you could have comfrey or yarrow and a ground cover of sweet potato or seminal pumpkin. And they all work in concert, taking as much energy from the sun taking up niches in this food forest so that you don't have weeds and you're producing soil as quickly as possible. So here we are, back to Charles. <laughs> the, the sandy sunbaked soil at the very beginning, eight years ago. <clears throat> and here we are uh, making pathways out of cardboard so cardboard is one of the best weed mats you can, you can use. And I know with Amazon around, <laughs> cardboard has become a very abundant resource. So worms, it's one of their favorite foods. So if we use these underutilized resources, put it down, put another underutilized resource, mulch. JEA gives mulch away for free. Put that on top, you're helping contain moisture. Um, feeding the soil and suppressing weeds all at the same time. And voila, <laughs> boom. <laughs> this, <laughs> this is what happens when you nourish the soil, pay attention to your water and plant densely with the diversity of plants that nourish not only the environment and ecosystem 
insects, butterflies, pollinators, but also give us food and give us habitat. And here we are again. This is in the front kitchen garden, um, laid cardboard down. And if it's a flat surface, you can pretty much do whatever design that you like. Lace the wood chips down and plant your plants. Now there's, obviously we brought in other things, compost, um, use uh, cover crops. And uh, here's our fruit trees. <clears throat> uh, we're experimenting with different types of fruit trees. We planted plums, peaches, jujubes, Asian pears. Papaya does amazingly well. Um, uh, what else do we have? Uh, avocado, uh, gua pineapple guava, strawberry guava, uh, white sapote. Um, and there was existing citrus there. Of course, citrus does really well. Olives. Uh, so we placed them in the food forest. Um, there, so the pathways are the, the cardboard and wood chips and in the beds, we either turned it over and threw a cover crop down and then planted straight into that. Uh, turn it over, put a cover crop and then you put your compost just in the holes where you're planting your other plants. So that makes it more economical than just blanketing the whole bed with compost. Um, daikon, this is a beautiful cover crop in the winter. It's called a soil buster. The roots go way deep. So if you have compaction in your soil, this is one beautiful way to, to help get to the under layers and get that water seeping farther down. So it's a resource for your plants and trees later. And here is the overhead of uh, the food forest as it's growing, you can see the little bit of grass field that's still left in the corner there. And this is just a few years after we started. So that was just an overview and Maddie's gonna get into more detail and give you more of a tour of Lana Kila and the other gardens at Charles. Thank you. Thank you, Valerie. Uh, my name is Madeline Ledoux, and I am the current garden manager of Lanaquila Gardens. I have been uh, working here for the past six years, and I would like to show you some photos of what the garden looks like eight years later after installation. Sure. Yeah, not enough hands. <laughs> this one? All right, so this is what the garden looks like eight years after installation. You can see that the canopy layer has grown in quite a lot. And um, Valerie, could I get your pointer? Yeah. Oh, okay, gotcha, thanks. All right, so you can see that the, the canopy layer is grown in um, in the top, we've got different trees, such as a white mulberry over here, green, um, bright green, black locusts over here, royal poinciana. Those are the tallest trees in the food forest uh, with the backdrop of live oak trees along Mandarin Road. Hold please. <laughs> Put that over your head. behind you until I, okay. All right, can you, can you hear me? All right. <laughs> uh, 
All right, so here we have the food forest um, in two different seasons. This is a springtime view of the very back of the food forest, the tallest layer. Um, here we have an avocado, a black locust, a Bauhenia purpurea, also known as a Hong Kong orchid tree, citrus trees that are just now um, setting fruit and they may still be flowering, a cardamom shrub layer, and then a ground cover vining sweet potato plant. In the fall, the citrus trees are just beginning to ripen. You can see a little bit of color here. The papaya tree has grown up uh, within six months, gotten very tall. We have a Tithonia diversifolia Mexican sunflower growing very tall in the background here. And the sweet potato plant has fully filled out and is ready to harvest. In the fall, we have many different layers of tropical shrubs and trees. This is the Royal Poinciana, which is almost three stories tall, and believe it or not, it is only three years old, grown from seed. The yellow flowering plant is a cassia pendula or butterfly cassia, so named because it is a butterfly host plant for the yellow sulfur butterfly. The vine that's growing into the cassia is a pumpkin vine. This is one of our favorite pumpkins, seminal pumpkin. It is endemic to South Florida, meaning that it is naturally occurring, um, possibly native or moved into South Florida from Central America, where it's originally from. And it grows very well for us with little to no maintenance at all. During the, um, the fall going into the winter, we've got lots of yellow flowers blooming everywhere. Another cassia pendula. This is another uh, Tithonia diversifolia Mexican sunflower, more Mexican sunflower on this edge. And then on the east side of the property, there is a large camphor tree where the passion fruit vine is growing up uh, very vigorously. Oops. Every winter we have an abundant harvest of passion fruit, it makes a very tangy, sour, sweet juice, um, and it drops when it's ready to be harvested all at once, all underneath this gigantic vine. And we collect it in buckets and try to squeeze and preserve as much of it as possible. Another example of a crop that grows with little to no maintenance is Rosedale hibiscus. We plant it in March and harvest in November. These little fruits are called calyxes, and they swell up much like a rose hip after the flower falls off. We will pop out the seed pod from these roselle calyxes and either dry them for tea or make jams and jellies or candied roselle, which is a very sweet and sour treat. If you've ever had red zinger tea before, this is what it's made out of. More pumpkins. Here we have a um, French cheese wheel pumpkin, which I believe is called rouge bif de temps, uh, which means little red stamps uh, growing in the food park. We allow the pumpkins to grow uh, spread along the mulch paths in the food park and also grow up the trees. So here it is growing next to a ground cover of yarrow, which is a medicinal herb with a very beautiful white um, umble type flower. More seminal pumpkin harvest. What I love about the seminal pumpkins, in addition to them being very low maintenance um, with high pest uh, resilience and um, they don't have a lot of fungal pressure, they don't have the same issues with powdery mildew as a jack-o'-lantern type pumpkin or a New England pie type pumpkin might have. Uh, so very easy to grow. And these small little pumpkins make exactly one <laughs> uh, cup of pumpkin puree once roasted. So very easy to measure. All of this produce is made possible by the everlasting mulch pile in the very back of the property. We're fortunate to be located on Mandarin Road where plenty of tree work is happening all of the time. So we have a couple arborists that we get in with and call up on the phone and say, hey, are you doing any tree work in the area? And would you like to drop off your gigantic load of wood chips on our property? 
So you never know what you're going to get because you get what you pay for and this is free material. Sometimes you get a um, hardwood sort of pine dominant uh, pile with a mixture of green pine straw and harder chips that last for six months to a year at a time before decomposing. And then sometimes you get something much greener, like this is ground up bamboo right here. There's all different kinds of trees and vines that people are trying to remove um, along Mandarin Road. So depending on if we get maple, it's going to decompose within a month. And if we get palm, it's going to decompose in a couple years. Uh, but most of the time, we just get a nice mixture of everything. We apply the wood chips to the garden with a process called sheet mulching. Here you can see that we are laying down cardboard, just like Valerie did at the beginning of the food parks installation. Then we wheelbarrow um, large barrows of wood chips and spread them out across the cardboard. There are many um, advantages to this. One is weed suppression. The larger, um, thicker layer that you put of wood chips on the paths, the, the easier it is to suppress weeds and the easier it is to weed those weeds when they do come up. So in this area in particular, we have dollar weed and betony. And the difference that I have seen in weed control over the last six years of working here is really astounding. And I'm definitely a believer in the sheet mulching process because what happens is you put the mulch on top of dollar weed rhizomes or betony tubers, and they're forced to rise to the surface in an area that's much more accessible for you to weed. So instead of trying to get your fingers into hard pan soil, you're weeding through this nice decomposed mulch and it's so much easier, it goes so much quicker. And um, overall, if you can get to the root of the problem, uh, you will actually see such great, um, uh, you'll never get rid of them completely, of course, but um, it's a really great weed control um, benefit. Another benefit of, of sheet mulching with wood chips is that it provides a layer of mulch to sponge up moisture after a heavy rain. So you all are probably familiar with hurricane season weather patterns and how we will have a very dry spring. And then after a dry April, March, and halfway through June, it starts to just dump every single day. Um, in areas that are prone to flooding in particular, wood chips can really help to sponge up extra moisture and, um, and then hold that moisture in to where surrounding plants, fruit trees, shrubs, annual vegetables can access it. And then our favorite thing about wood chips is how they break down after six months to a year to create a very rich, dark soil. Um, which is accessible to the root systems of the surrounding plants and trees as something similar to compost. So here we see mushroom activity moving in. Once the wood chips are applied, mushroom spores, just from naturally occurring from the environment, make their way into the wood chips. Now there are some types of fungus such as rust or powdery mildew that is undesirable in the landscape, but in this situation, the fungus uh, plays a very important role as a decomposer to decompose the organic matter and turn it into a very rich, dark, fertile soil. Here we see a handful of decomposing wood chips halfway broken down by the mushroom's underground network, which is called mycelium. That white, filmy, powdery stuff here, this is the mycelium going to work. Um, it colonizes the wood chips and it's looking for this thing called lignin, which is kind of like a, um, it's a substrate for the mushroom to grow on. And once it has fully colonized the lignin, then it begins the breakdown process. Uh, if you hold this up to your face and smell it, it smells like freshly cut portobello mushrooms, like if you're making spaghetti. <laughs> so this is the desirable kind of fungal activity to have in your garden and this does not have any um, bad effects on, on the plants. And next to this photo, we've got the end result, which is this nice dark soil. Um, in my other hand is the sand, the basically nu super nutrient poor, free draining, 
um, just sterile sand that we started out with. Um, more images of very delicious dark soil. And because we are in a constant state of applying wood chips, we are also in a constant state of um, having this nice broken down soil. So if you were to stop applying the wood chips at any point, um, eventually everything wants to decompose. Organic matter plus heat plus moisture equals decomposition. So it's important for us to continue to apply these wood chips. Um, another strategy that we use for adding fertility organically to the property is by collecting oak leaves. So we have about a dozen oak trees, um, live oak trees, all throughout the property. They're uh, massive, and in March, when they all drop their leaves, we instead of bagging them up and putting them by the curb for yard waste collection, we store them um, in these piles. So you can either leave them in piles and let them get uh, moist and turn them occasionally, and that makes something called leaf mold. Again, desirable, not the bad type of mold. Or you can use them as a carbon base for a compost pile and put your kitchen scraps in it and then turn it as you normally would a compost pile instead of purchasing hay, for example, at the feed store and then composting into that. Yet another um, strategy that we have for building fertility in our garden is this worm bin. So you can compost into a worm bin. Here we have a reclaimed uh, bathtub that has been uh, built uh, with a lid on top of it to keep all the critters out, any raccoons or other undesirables. The end product, after putting in cardboard, uh, newspaper clippings, and kitchen scraps into this worm bin where a family of earthworms lives, um, is this nice dark soil that is a little bit different from the other dark soils I've been showing you. This is called worm casting. And it's a very expensive garden amendment. If you go to the nursery, it's about $25 a bag. And it is high in nitrogen and other trace minerals. All of these forms of fertility are uh, responsible for the produce that we grow here um, in our kitchen garden. In the summertime, we grow cucumbers and cherry tomatoes. In the winter, we grow cauliflower and Romanesco broccoli. In the spring, we have leeks, cilantro, and romaine, and many others. In the kitchen garden, we plant very intensively. So what that means is if you look up the recommended spacing of different vegetables, they might tell you plant this 18 inches apart. And we end up planting things more like nine inches apart. And we are able to do this because we are staggering the harvest times of different uh, produce. So instead of planting something that you put it in all at once in September and you harvest it all at once in January, we are constantly planting, we are constantly harvesting, and we are able to have a little bit of everything throughout the year, which is a lot more manageable than having a whole lot of everything all at once. Here's another example of the intensive planting. Um, in my hand, I have cilantro, arugula, and oak leaf lettuce. And behind me is uh, cat soy, which is like a low growing bok choy, different kinds of purple bok choys, and kale, oak leaf lettuce, romaine. And this is a border of arugula here. Skip the slide. Another example of our intensive planting pattern would be this bed here, where we have frisee, which is like a bitter salad green, next to romaine lettuce, and dill that has been grown from seed. By the time that the romaine is ready to harvest, we leave the dill in order to grow and be harvested leaf by leaf for another two months at a time, after which time it flowers and then produces seed and we save that seed for next year's crop. 
Another strategy that we use in the kitchen garden to reduce uh, pest damage and to increase the aesthetically pleasing um, uh, space is to interplant flowers with vegetables. So here I have a stand of broccoli. Underneath this is blue lobelia grown from seed. Uh, grown from seed also is this uh, white alyssum next to some cut flowers. These are double and open snapdragons. And here you can see behind the broccoli, there are um, edible chrysanthemums. Back here. A border of cardoons, asparagus, more broccoli, lobelia, alyssum, cut flowers. This is a large papaya. And we're just mixing everything together as much as possible. That way, you know, when I harvest the broccoli, and take the broccoli out to put something else in. Everything else is still going. So there's always a visual interest and there's always something to harvest. This is what it looks like this week in the summertime. Um, this is a very large <laughs> towering structure of cherry tomatoes, uh, sun gold cherry tomato and super sweet 100. This is a patty pan squash that's growing quite large here next to fennel, which I love to interplant with vegetables because it is such a great ladybug attractant. They love to um, host on the blooming fennel plants and you get lots of ladybug larvae, which are the, the part of the ladybug life cycle that eat the most aphids. So you really wanna welcome those in. And next to the, behind the patty pan is a larkspur, which you can barely see. And this is all cosmos with kale in the background, last of the kale. The border of the kitchen garden is a um, mixture of both perennial and self-sown annual plants. So right here I have cardoons grown from seed. A cardoon is kind of like a mini artichoke that's much easier to grow in our climate. Um, it provides a very beautiful silver foliage, kind of an architectural plant that just helps to hold the space when so many other things around it are in flux and changing with the seasons. Um, these orange and yellow flowers are nasturtiums, and I don't even plant these anymore because they drop seeds every year, come back from seed and pop up wherever they like. If they're in a spot that is in the way of something else, I will weed them out, pop them up and plant them somewhere else on the property. They're wonderful because they bloom for three to four months at the time. They have edible flowers and leaves and they just grow absolutely anywhere and are happy with any kind of soil. Another shot of the cardoon with asparagus fern on either sides. So this is not the, the foxtail asparagus fern that you might buy in a, in a landscaping store. This is actually asparagus plants and they have this really gorgeous ferny foliage after the um, asparagus um, after the asparagus is, is done. All right, so here's our nursery. We grow 95% of what we plant from seed. This is very important to how the garden um, grows. And this is a very easy DIY setup that you could probably do at your home too. This is all just um, dock wood that has been washed ashore uh, with cinder blocks underneath. There's a, a hose bib on one side with a PVC pipe that goes down this length with three shrub heads that um, emit water at 180 degrees and go off two times a day for five minutes. This is enough to keep all of the seedlings nice and moist and happy. We're also on well water, which is a huge advantage because well water has lots of um, different minerals that city water does not, and it has no chlorine. So plants are sometimes very sensitive to chlorine and city water. These are the little baby seedlings. Right here I have snapdragons from seed. Grow them in these small cells and then pot them up into this four inch container. This is similar to what you might find in a nursery. And in my opinion, this is the perfect stage to pot out into the ground. You want them to where they're still small enough to where they 
they're not root bound, so they don't go through as much transplant shock, but large enough to where they can fend for themselves. And if a snail or slug or rabbit kind of comes through, they have a better chance of surviving. And I would say we have like a 90 to 95% success rate with this system. I have a large seed collection of over 500 seed packets at any given point in time and <laughs> a wine cooler with, with which to keep them cold. Um, uh, I'm always in the process of collecting different seed companies, different cultivars. For example, here, this was a Lobelia trial. I started a Lobelia that was called Sapphire, Cambridge Blue, and Blue Heaven. And of this trial, I think Blue Heaven was the best performing. Um, but this is an example of the type of data collection that happens here and what we've learned through many years of growing. This is the newest addition to the property. Um, in summer 2019, one tenth of an acre was cleared to make a micro flower farm with the intention of growing cut flowers for sale to florists. Started as a field of grass. And now <laughs> the flower field consists of four 70 foot long rows with the serpentine curve that adds visual interest to this large space. The flower growing season begins in fall when we add finished compost, oak leaves and wood chips to prep the beds for next year's crops. Young plants are grown from seed and are planted into the beds as early as possible. They don't look like much when they go in, but this is the approach that yields the healthiest, most productive plants in the long term. Here I have a list them from seed. There it is growing in and much greener about a month after planting. And now blooming. About three months later. So before and after. This is a mixed border of white alyssum, blue lobelia, California poppy, corn poppy, which in this photo is yet to bloom, linaria, also known as baby snapdragon, or Leia in the background, which is cut and sold to florists, as well as foxgloves and Ami, also known as false Queen Anne's lace. So in the springtime, this is when we really hit our stride and start to have stems available for sale to florists every month of the year. That's the goal. And here we are with the ranunculus in full bloom. This is one of our favorite um, crops, one of the highest yielding with the longest base life of up to two weeks. And now I want to take you on a tour of what's in bloom every month of the year. So in January, we have anemones and roses. More anemones that come in many different colors, white, blue, red, as well as others. These have a week and a half base life. Gorgeous red anemone. This really intense blue, love to grow blue flowers as they're so rare in nature. After anemones come calendula, you may be familiar with calendula as a medicinal herb and as an edible flower, but there is also calendula that has been uh, grown as a cut flower that has nice long stems and a very respectable vase life. More calendula and ranunculus. And next up is the ranunculus, which blooms all throughout March and April. It's definitely the highlight of the spring season. Um, it comes in every color that you can think of, but one of our favorites this year is this wonderful salmon color that has a dark center. And as it opens, it exposes this almost completely black center. More ranunculus, me with ranunculus. <laughs> and towards the end of the spring, when I'm harvesting these buckets for florists, I don't florists, I don't have to do any arranging at all in order to make it look really astounding because the kind of abundance that we have around late March, April, May is just really, really lots of fun. <laughs> so 
here we have Ami, ranunculus in many different colors, orange, yellow, pink, the first of the foxglove, and the first of the snapdragon, and calendula. Now this is what the uh, floral studio looks like during a typical holiday, such as Valentine's Day, Mother's Day, or Easter. I'm making uh, lots of different 100% uh, homegrown bouquets from all of our abundance. I have some behind me on the stage. More examples of bouquets. These are both Easter bouquets. Again, 100% homegrown. This is an Amaryllis, a Louis Philippe China Rose, a Nacho G. Noisette Rose. Ami, and over here, foxglove, more tea roses, and more Ami, and the last of the ranunculus as it winds down. This is a, a new one to us this year. Uh, this is called Stock, and it grew uh, extremely well. Very tall flowers, really wonderful fragrance, very, very like nostalgic fragrance. To me, it is what every florist should smell like. Uh, Nigella, which is a European wildflower, it is a really intense blue, starts off very pale blue, and as it ages, it becomes kind of an indigo, sort of the color of my dress, which is just, again, it's very hard to find in nature, so I grow blue flowers when I can. We also grow lavender foxgloves, double snapdragons, which smell to me like banana Laffy Taffy. And as the snapdragons are in uh, full force here, we have, um, these are the double snapdragons um, that are putting on a show. Next to the double snapdragons are zinnias that are just starting to bud up. So as the snapdragons retire and they're no longer productive, the zinnias will be in full force. So this is the type of crop planning that we do in order to have a successive harvest throughout the year instead of planting all at once. As the spring season winds down, the shape and texture of the petals changes quite a lot. We go from sort of a translucent pastel palette to something that's a little more opaque, a little more blocky, bright summer colors, such as what we're growing right now, uh, Cosmos here, and False Queen Anne's Lace Ami, the last of the foxgloves and the last of the larkspur. And then we move on to maybe <laughs> zinnias, which also come in almost every color. They are the workhorse of the summer garden. More zinnias. And then we also grow during the summertime black eyed Susan, uh, Rudbeckia. And one of our absolute favorites this past year has been dahlias from seed. So these are not the big massive dinner plate dahlias with lots of petals that you can grow up north. These are um, just single dahlias or collared dahlias. Uh, sometimes they're semi-double, such as the photo um, right over here. We've had a lot of success with them, and so this year we're growing quite a lot. And what's nice about the dahlias is that they grow during a period where not a lot else is in bloom. So as we transition out of summer and into fall, it becomes a little more difficult to fill uh, availability every single week. But in the fall, for example, we've got um, Rudbeckia and more sort of harvest colors and this cranberry hibiscus, which is a wonderful foliage plant, both in the garden and in the vase. The newest addition to this flower farm area is a little expansion project towards the back where it was kind of an awkward space to mow. And you can see that much like everywhere else on the property, we started with pure sand. Pure sand. And with the addition of lots of wood chips, homemade compost, and oak leaves, we now have this sort of English style border of silver cardoons grown from seed, roses, both noisette and tea roses that are all grown from cuttings 
and an excess of foxgloves that are now all in full bloom. So as we transition out of the flower field, we move towards what we call the formal garden. It's a bit more wild now than it was in its original conception. It was made by Cheryl's father in the 1960s. Um, and the highlight of the formal garden is most definitely the very ancient live oak tree in the backdrop here. Although the formal garden is surrounded by oak trees, which is where the majority of the leaf drop comes from. <laughs> We have plein air events and bird watching events in the formal garden as well as throughout the property. But the painters uh, who come and, and do a plein air painting event definitely favor the structure of the live oak trees. Here's another shot looking towards the river. And now we move away from the formal garden and, uh, and towards the river garden. As you can see, this, uh, this new addition to the property, the river garden, is at the base of a very steep hill. So in this area here, we have the bulkhead next to the river. And this lowest area is very prone to flooding after a tropical storm and most definitely after a hurricane. So on a normal day, you can walk around and in the lowest points of this floodplain, it's very mucky and, uh, and soggy. So we're pretty limited on our plant palette in terms of what we can successfully grow here. But the last few years have been dedicated to experimenting with what uh, water loving plants can deal with both a flood prone soil and brackish water intrusion from the St. John's River. One of um, our favorite plants to grow in this area is our native blue flag iris, Iris virginica, which has these, sorry, <laughs> it has these gorgeous um, lavender flowers for most of late February and throughout March. Very low maintenance, does not need a, a whole lot in the way of, of any kind of fertility or just wants part to full sun and um, it prefers to be in an area that is mucky, soggy with wet feet. Another one that we've grown with success is uh, shell ginger, which is a very tall uh, plant that has these beautiful um, cl inflorescences, clusters of um, white shell-like shell uh, ginger flowers that then open up to have a yellow center. We have also had good success with crinum lilies and butterfly ginger. And we have quite a lot of bananas um, by the river as well. So every couple of months we go into the river jungle to check and see if there are any bananas, baby bananas or plantains that are ready for harvest. And again, they grow on their own without really any intervention. So here are some views of the river. So in conclusion, it is our hope that Lanakila Garden inspires you to consider the benefits of building a biodiverse garden ecosystem with a focus on soil building, dynamic plant choice, and environmentally sustainable organic practices. This is the type of resilient garden design and landscape stewardship that we would like to see implemented throughout Northeast Florida. It is our hope that Lanakila Garden continues to be a source of inspiration and education for the Jacksonville Garden community. Thank you.